Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the library this afternoon. My name's Renee, and I'm delighted that you could join us on this beautiful afternoon. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are watching the program via live stream. If you would, please note your feedback forms in the chairs. Leave us a note. Drop it in the box in the back. Let us know what you think of the program today and give us some ideas for the future. <clears throat> With that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. For more than a decade, Eric Fuselet has been studying the native plants found growing wild in the Ozarks. Eric's passion began while spending time in the Ozark wilderness as an avid hiker and backpacker. Eventually, Eric was able to put his knowledge of native plants to use in a professional capacity as an environmental scientist for a local civil engineering firm. Eric's been involved in the planning and development of several native plant gardens in northwest Arkansas and is currently serving as a president of the Ozark chapter of the Arkansas Native Plant Society as well as vice president of Arkansas Native Plant Society at the state level. With that, please help me welcome Eric Fuselet. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here today. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak here at the Fayetteville Public Library regarding landscaping with native plants, which is one of my passions and I hope the passion of a lot of you here today or else you probably wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> Can I get a show of hands, kind of see? Uh, is there anyone here that's an Arkansas master naturalist? Okay, great. Well, this should get you some advanced training hours or an hour at least. Uh, unless I end up talking too long, then it might be more than an hour, but I'll try not to do that. Um, anybody here heard of the Arkansas Native Plant Society? Good, good. I like to see that. Well, we have a Facebook page uh, for the Arkansas Native Plant Society. Excuse me, I need to take a drink. Uh, we also have a Facebook page for the Arkansas Native Plant Society's Ozark chapter. Um, the Ozark chapter does have, uh, we, we post things that are more specific to the Ozark region, um, the events happening around here, native plant cells, uh, whatnot. So uh, if you're on Facebook, just go give us a like and it really help with, uh, if you want to keep up with what all is going around here for if you want to get some native plants uh, to plant in your garden or just learn more about native plants in general. Uh, I'd also like to give a plug for a new organization we've started and uh, called Wild Ones. We have an Ozark chapter of Wild Ones. Wild Ones is a organization developed or dedicated to promoting uh, native plants and landscaping and ecologically beneficial landscaping practices. Uh, there are some brochures on those back tables uh, on Wild Ones and the Arkansas Native Plant Society that uh, before you leave, if you're interested and you'd like to pick some up, uh, feel free. And if we run out, let me know and I can try and get some more. So. All right, well, let's, let's get started here. Landscaping with Ozark native plants. Looks like I'm breathing into the mic a little bit here. All right, just an outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to go into first a little bit of the ecology of native plants, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that here in just a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the benefits of using native plants and why native plants offer more advantages uh, if you use them versus their non-native counterparts. Uh, going to talk uh, about uh, different things you need to consider when you're planning and designing your native plant garden. And when we get to that point, I really want you to start thinking about your yard or your property or where it is you would like to put a garden or a native plant garden. Think about the conditions that are there. And that's uh, the part of the talk where we're going to be kind of helping you figure out what plants would work there and how to figure out whether a certain species would uh, thrive or survive there or not. Uh, then we're going to go into some ideas of different projects you can use for native plant or use native plants for on your property, and then how to manage and maintain these native species. So first, the ecology of native plants. What do I mean when I talk about the ecology of native plants? What I'm talking about is the role that native plants play in the local ecosystem. What kind of relationships do they already have? with local uh, species of wildlife, pollinators, insects, whatnot. First, let's define what a native plant is. Um, I have a very simplified definition here. It uh, can get more complicated, but for the purposes of this talk, we're just going to say that a plant is considered native uh, when it is growing in the region in which it evolved. 
Uh, they native plants, since they are part of the local ecosystem, uh, provide nectar for pollinators such as hummingbirds, butterflies, moths, and other beneficial insects. Uh, many species rely on native plants for the resources they need to live and to complete their life cycles and reproductive cycles. In short, native plants are already a part of the web of life. I got a little quote there by John Muir about how when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So native plants, when we, because of this, when we plant native species, uh, this helps improve the biodiversity of the built environment. Because, I mean, a single native plant may attract insects that might use it to either for food or to lay its eggs on. Uh, maybe there's a butterfly that lays its eggs on there, then suddenly there are caterpillars growing on those plants. Well, what do you think most birds like to feed their little hatchlings in the nest? They use a lot of caterpillars. So butterflies are very important for sustaining bird populations. And what's important for sustaining butterfly populations? Native plants. So if you're a birder and you just want to attract more birds to your yard, plant native plants. Or if you just like butterflies and insects, plant native plants. If you like pretty wildflowers, plant native plants. That's, that's what I like to tell people. So, um, but planting native plants can also be important for species conservation. Since now many of the native species of birds and insects and other wildlife have been co-evolving with native species of plants for a long, long time. And some species have become de completely dependent on native species, plant species, in order to complete their life cycles. Case in point, monarch butterflies. They require milkweeds along their flyway each year uh, to complete their annual migration. That migration often can take uh, multiple generations for those monarchs to complete, to go from Mexico all the way to the northern part of the United States and then back down to Mexico each year. So when we have a lot of land use change and development without replacing it with some milkweeds in that area, then we ended up, we ended up getting, um, you know, it kind of severs that ability of the monarchs to complete that migration. So not only they require milkweeds for food, they also lay their eggs on these milkweed plants. Um, and then those eggs hatch, uh, turn into adult butterflies, and then go on to continue that journey each year. Northern bobwhite quails, These are, this is another species that has seen a sharp decline in recent years due to loss of habitat. They inhabit prairies, savannas, and open woodlands, and they depend on the native species associated with these habitats, especially when it comes to finding food to feed their young. So when we destroy these habitats, they can't feed their young, and then there's less bobwhite quail in the natural world. But due to efforts such as um, quail forever. Uh, there's been a lot of upland habitat restoration uh, in attempts to bring back these bobwhites. So urbanization and development can create this habitat fragmentation and planting natives is a way to help patch back in some of that habitat uh, that's lost due to urbanization, agricultural development, uh, whatnot. So in effect, when we plant native species, we are reweaving re that web of life back into our built environment. So what benefits do native species offer us that non-native species do not? Well, for one thing we need to know about native species is they're very deep root systems. Uh, these deep roots are what help them get through those dry summer months without having to be watered. Uh, these roots go deep into the ground and are able to pull moisture up um, I mean, if you think about it, nobody goes out and waters the forest during months of July and August. Nobody goes out and waters the prairie. These plants are already adapted to the amount of precipitation that falls in a normal year. These deep roots also hold, help hold the soil in place, so they're really great for erosion control. Uh, they improve the soil's ability to absorb and filter water. Uh, this also helps reduce the amount of runoff that's entering our local waterways and helps remove pollutants before they enter our local rivers and streams. Soil has an amazing ability to filter and purify water. Because they're already adapted to the amount of precipitation we typically receive around here, 
uh, or in an area in which they grow in a given year. Uh, they can survive mostly on the rain that falls from the sky. So when we use native species, uh, we, get, we don't have to worry about irrigating or watering them as much. So native species can really, because they're less maintenance, can really help us save some money. Um, I think this is a great benefit for local municipalities as well as homeowners uh, when we want to use natives in our landscaping as opposed to all the non-natives that require you to water in them. And, you know, they can be kind of picky on how they live sometimes. Also, native plants are adapted to the soils we have around here, which are pretty low quality for the most part. Um, because of that, there too many nutrients can actually be bad. So that can cause plants to grow too tall and to fall over. When I first started planting natives, I started trying to do it in containers. And I made the mistake of going and getting miracle Grow soil from Walmart and trying to plant native plants in that. And what I ended up with was coneflowers that grew and then fell over. So I just had all these coneflowers just laying around, hanging over the sides of my container. And then I finally realized, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, they need, I'm giving them way too many nutrients. It's like putting them on steroids and they just can't handle it. Because they're already part of the local ecosystem, they're already adapted to many of the pests that are here. So when we use natives, we, uh, we can get a reduction in the amount of pesticide usage uh, that we're applying to a lot of these plants. Uh, that can also be a cost saving mechanism, but can also help reduce uh, the cost to society of people coming into contact with those pesticides and all the different health problems that might come from that. And using native species can also reduce the amount of invasive species in the ecosystem. Many of the invasive species we struggle with today originally started out as garden plants, or they were used um, like kudzu, you know, for erosion control. But, you know, if we had come up with a native option, we might not have had the same issues we're currently struggling with with kudzu. All right, so what do you need to think about when you're planning and designing your native plant garden? First, you look to nature. Note the environmental conditions of the location where you see a particular plant species growing in the wild. Where does that species like to grow? Uh, what kind of soil moisture does it like? Soil pH, how much sunlight does it like to grow in? Does it like full sun, partial sun or shade? Uh, some of this, you might not know what species uh, are out there. And that's where I really encourage you to come on the hikes with the Native Plant Society. It's a really great way to learn what native species grow around us here in the Ozarks. Uh, and I'm gonna go over some species in, here in a little bit and tell you which conditions they like to grow in too. So you might make some notes given what kind of conditions you have in your yard. As far as soil moisture goes, uh, a resource I like to refer to people to to see the, what type of soil moisture conditions a particular species like is to go to plants.usda.gov. You can enter the name of a species in uh, the search box. And then uh, in this example, I entered Quercus alba, which is white oak. And it comes up with a range map. You could see um, the fact that it's Shown in green means that it is a native. If it were blue, it would be introduced. So it's also another way you can check to see if a species is native to this region or not. Um, for soil moisture, this information uh, I'm about to tell you was developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so if you wanna go straight to the source for a list of all the plants uh, that um, in Arkansas, you can go to wetland-plants.usace.army.mil. Uh, plants.usda.gov might be a little more user friendly. But you'll notice I pulled up Quercus alba and then there's a tab at the top that says wetland. If you click on that tab, it pulls up what are called the wetland indicator statuses. And you'll see that it lists uh, these different regions within North America, the Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain, Eastern Mountain and Piedmont, Great Plains, Midwest, uh, so a particular species may have a different wetland indicator status for a different region of the country. A lot of times they're pretty close to each other, but sometimes they can be different. We here in the Ozarks are in what in the region called the Eastern Mountain and Piedmont. So this is a map of the Eastern Mountains and Piedmont region. 
Uh, the other half of Arkansas is in the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plain. So if you're planting something in southern or eastern Arkansas, you would want to know what the wetland indicator status is for a plant in that region. Okay, so here are the different wetland indicator statuses. So we have UPL, which means a plant is an upland plant. It's going to like dry, well-drained areas. Um, you see at the bottom, OBL is an obligate wetland plant. Those are things like cattails, button bush, stuff that likes moist feet. Right in the middle, middle is facultative. Uh, those do well, uh, can handle some moisture, some dryness. Uh, can't handle too much of either one usually, but facultative up and facultative wetland uh, would be kind of the middle gradations between the facultative and the upland or the obligate wetland statuses. So just think the plants that like the driest conditions are going to be on that UPL or, or the FACU. Plants that like the wetter conditions are going, you're going to see an OBL or FACW. And plants that handle that transition zone uh, in between are going to be FAC. And for those of you who are my, you know, taking notes or whatnot, uh, if you want to copy these slides when we're done, I'll, I'll give you my card and contact info. I'll be happy to send you a copy of the slides. So, so obligate and facultative wet species, these are going to be good to plant in low areas on the landscape, poorly drained areas that tend to stay wet. So rain gardens, pond edges, uh, edges of streams, if you have any on your property. Facultative species, like moderately dry or moderately wet areas, you can still use these in rain gardens if the rain garden you know, drains well enough. Uh, north facing slopes that don't get a lot of sun, you know, a lot of times those will support mesic forests that are a little bit moist. Uh, the transition zones between wet and dry soils. Facultative up and upland species are going to be great for uplands and hilltops, uh, areas that are well drained, sandy soils, south and west facing slopes that get a lot of sun. All right, so what about sunlight duration? So native plants that like full sun, uh, these are going to be plants that you find in their natural habitat in prairies and glades, these open areas. At home, you can plant these in wide open areas that get that full sun, south facing slopes or the south side of your house or building. So native flowers that like full sun, we got tick seed sunflower. You'll notice I put the wetland indicator statuses by the names of each of these so you can kind of get an idea. Does it like well drained soil? Does it like wetter soil? If you do not see a wetland indicator status, like over here on compass plant or butterfly milkweed, you can assume that it's an upland species because the list was really developed to help wetland scientists know which plants uh, grew a lot in wetlands. So the plants that they left off their list are plants you don't see in wetlands, so upland species. So Plains coreopsis. This is a picture that Jane Pirtle probably recognizes from the Omni native plant garden that she was a big part of helping plant. So, butterfly milkweed and spider milkweed, they both like open sunny areas with well-drained soil. Compass plant that likes glades, prairies. About some native, some more native flowers for full sun, pale purple cone flower, bee balm, hairy wild petunia, Ohio spiderwort. See Ohio spiderwort, it's got that facultative wetland indicator status. And you notice where you see a lot of it, you know, a lot of roadsides, even ditches. So areas that, you know, get moist and then dry out. So it's kind of the in-between. Native grasses for full sun, switchgrass, eastern gamma grass. Uh, switchgrass does great in a lot of areas. Uh, it's really helpful to be used uh, along stream banks, along the edge of farm fields. Uh, it can suck up or take up a lot of nitrogen so it's really great for uh, fertilizer's been applied to a field and say a heavy rain comes, uh, it has those deep root systems um, and it grows real thick to where any runoff, it'll help filter that out uh, and suck up uh, some of the nitrogen before it gets into the local stream or waterway. Big blue stem and Indian grass. These also like full sun. Notice Indian grass likes that upland type uh, 
well-drained area. Native shrubs for full sun, common button bush. It's an obligate. You're going to put on, want to put that either on a pond edge or edge of a stream, maybe the center of a rain garden at the lowest point where you're going to have water sticking around a little more often. False indigo bush. It's another one that likes wet areas. How about some native vines for full sun? Purple passion flowers. Anybody ever eaten one of those wild passion fruits that these produce? If you haven't, I just really recommend it. It's my, probably one of my favorite wild foods. It's delicious. Wild potato vine. It's the one that likes upland areas. All right, so what about native plants that do well in either full sun or partial sun? These, uh, well, you can find in savannas, open forest, forest edges, open prairies and glades. Places where you can plant these would be the south, east, or west side of your house or building. These are going to be a little a bit more versatile than the ones we just talked about. Wild strawberries, they like upland areas. Uh, wild strawberries will grow and spread and form a mat. We have some wild strawberries at our place. Uh, the strawberries are delicious. Um, we also notice that every spring there is a box turtle that likes to visit the wild strawberry patch. So they're like right on that mouth level for the box turtle. So knowing how long box turtles can live, I do kind of wonder how long has that box turtle been visiting that same strawberry patch? That could have been 50 years for all I know. But. Cream false indigo, rattlesnake master. A friend of mine commented one time that she thought rattlesnake master would make a really great name for a heavy metal band. So. Native flowers are full of partial sun, wild quinine, flowering spurge, uh, shooting star. These are all going to do well in the upland areas, dry, well-drained areas. Blue-eyed grass. It looks like a grass. It's actually an iris. It can easily be mistaken for a grass. It grows in this clump formation. Um, but it, since it's a monocot like grasses are, then the grass of the leaves are very long and grass-like, very easily mistaken for a grass. Cardinal flower. Uh, a lot, if anybody here likes to canoe or kayak in July, uh, or August, you'll often see cardinal flower and bloom along the riverbanks. So that's another great one. It's also really great for hummingbirds. Uh, the shape of the flower kind of lends itself to those long hummingbird beaks to reach down into. Uh, great blue lobelia, another one that you'll see a lot along the riverbanks, uh, usually later in the summer, August, September. About native grasses for full or partial sun, little blue stem, purple mully. Both of those are going to like some drier, well-drained areas. Native shrubs are full of partial sun. Uh, I put eastern redbud in the shrub category. It is technically a tree. It's an understory tree. Uh, but since um, it's a small tree, I decided to lump it in here with the shrubs. Uh, American beautyberry, fragrant sumac. These all like well-drained areas. Elderberry. There you're getting, it's a more facultative plant, so you can probably put it in an area that gets a little bit more moisture. Uh, Carolina Rose. Rusty Black Haw has beautiful white flowers uh, in the spring, early summer, and then in the fall and winter, it produces gorgeous um, leaf colors and fruit colors. New Jersey Tea. So it's another great one that likes well-drained areas. American wisteria. You know, we have our own native species of wisteria in North America. So you don't have to worry about getting that non-native one that can kind of become, get a little out of control sometimes, can be a little noxious at times. Beautiful flowers. Muscadine grape. Trumpet honeysuckle, another really great one for hummingbirds. A lot of those trumpet-shaped flowers hummingbirds love because they got those long beaks. Prairie rose, climbing milkweed, one of those milkweed species that's actually a vine. All right, what about native plants that will do well just in partial sun? Where we typically find these in the natural world? Well, open forests, savannas, forest edges. Uh, we can plant these under a tall tree, maybe, that provides shade for part of the day. Uh, east side of a house or building, so it can get that morning sun and then get some shade later during the hotter part of the day. Has anybody ever seen spotted jewelweed in the wild? 
Yeah, have y'all touched one of the seeds when they're ripe? Yep, that's why they call it uh, spotted touch me not. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's a mechanism it uses to spread its seed or distribute it. It's like an exploding type mechanism. So there's something that's coiled up real tight. And when you touch it, it uncoils and sends the seeds everywhere. So you might know why it's called jewel weed. If you take one of the leaves and you hold it under water, there's some sort of hydrophobic type thing on the surface to where if you rock it back and forth, there's a silvery shimmer that comes across the, le the leaf. So it looks kind of like a jewel. Uh, another fun little thing about that plant. Yes, uh, yeah, the uh, stem has that really great juice in it that's good for uh, skin irritation, whatnot. Poison ivy, mosquito bite, stinging nettle, yep. You can uh, collect some, puree it, and then freeze it in ice cube trays if you wanted to, or some people use it to make soap, and when they get poison ivy, they'll you know, rub that soap on their so. A dock is another one that has the same properties. So. Native wildflowers for partial sun. Mountain mint, that's a really great one for pollinators. I mean, that one will bring a lot of pollinators to your yard. Uh, mist flower, downy phlox. Downy phlox is one of those early flowering spring plants. Uh, there is also uh, an Ozark variety called Ozark uh, downy phlox that's native to this region. And so, some locations like Missouri Wildflower Nursery, I believe, carries that specific variety. How about some native ferns for partial sun? Marginal wood fern, royal fern, cinnamon fern produces those really nice reddish brown cinnamon looking sticks. Native grasses, river oats, Virginia wild rye. River oats are great also for some winter uh, persistent vegetation for some winter aesthetics. So the seeds you see here it produces those later in the summer, and they'll often stick around in the winter. So when you have a whole bunch of them, uh, it can look really pretty together. And then when the wind blows and they all shimmer together, that can, that can be really nice. Deerberry, it's a good shrub. Uh, flowering dogwood. Like I said, I put a lot of the understory trees in the shrub category. Yes, flowering dogwood likes more facultative upland regions. Strawberry bush. I think other people call this hearts of bustin'. I really like the fruit on that one. See, it produces that purple casing that opens up and those little red berries pop out. Uh, red buckeye produces really beautiful red flowers in the spring. Uh, and then late summer, fall, you'll start to see these buckeye fruits are, are produced. And the old folk saying was that they brought you good luck if you put one of the buckeyes in your pocket, right? Carry it around with you. About some vines, Virginia creeper. That's a really great vine, likes upland areas. Dutchman's pipe vine, that flower looks very pipe-like. And I'm assuming that is a host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail. Okay, thank you for confirming that. So my assumption was just based on the name and that could be risky. So. All right, what about native plants for full shade? In their natural habitat, you're going to find these in the deep forest where they have a, a pretty closed canopy. Uh, plants that are adapted to full shade often need a little bit more fertile soil because they're used to that fertile forest soil where the leaves are falling down on it and it's adding a lot of organic matter. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Planting locations, north facing slopes here in the Ozarks, those very rarely see sun. Uh, the north sides of houses or buildings that stay shady all day. Some wildflowers for full shade. Uh, dwarf crested iris is one of my favorites. That's actually the flower that got me into plant ID. A wild ginger, uh, it's a great ground cover. I have that planted underneath our deck off the back of our house. Uh, Ruin emony, one of those spring ephemerals that we'll be seeing here very, very soon, if not already. Wild geraniums, those will be coming out here pretty soon too. Columbine, wood betony. Uh, the jack in the pulpit likes a little bit wetter areas. I see it a lot on the north slopes of stuff, uh, of hillsides and whatnot, where it stays pretty moist. About some native ferns for full shade. Marginal wood fern, royal fern, southern lady fern. 
Northern Maiden Hair Fern. It's one of my favorites around here. Then Christmas fern, especially if you want something that, uh, it's gonna stay, one of our evergreen ferns, it's gonna stay green during the winter time. Christmas fern is a great uh, example of one of those. Again, native grasses for full shade. We got our river oats and Virginia wild rye again. Pawpaws, who here likes pawpaws? Yeah, it's uh, technically an understory tree. Stuck it in here with the shrubs. Uh, flowering dogwood and common witch hazel. That's one that flowers October, November, maybe early December. Uh, the witch hazels, the common witch hazel and the Ozark witch hazel, there are winter flowering species here, two of them that we have. Uh, they have a special relationship with uh, the, a certain moth, a winter moth uh, that uses them. Again, strawberry bush. Northern spice bush. Uh, that's one you see a lot along stream banks and north slopes. Wild hydrangeas. I really like wild hydrangeas. They have these false flowers along the edge of the flower heads. Um, and that's really just meant to attract the insects to the flower head. And then when they get up close, they say, oh, well, here's all the goods right in here in the middle. But they're just a little less visible from a distance. All right, so some design considerations. Uh, group same species together. That's really going to help pull your eye or the eye of the viewer to that location. If you have a grouping of cone flowers and a grouping of, you know, I don't know, a spider wart or something, then, you know, I've seen some plantings where it's just kind of a homogenous mix of different species. And, you know, that can have its own value as far as the color. But um, sometimes it's like, you know, you look and, okay, you've seen it. You know, but if you have these groupings, that can really add to the aesthetics of your garden. Bloom period, you know, keep in mind when certain species are going to bloom. Some are going to bloom early spring. Some are not going to bloom until later in the summer. Some might not bloom until very end of the summer, beginning of fall. Floral layering, how, how tall does a species grow uh, when it's reached its, the end of its life cycle and it starts to produce flowers? Um, Ernest spiderwort, that one blooms before the Ohio spiderwort, but it only grows about that tall. So it's an early flowering short one you might want to put up front, and the later flowering taller one you might want to put maybe along a fence, or if you're doing a circular garden, maybe towards the middle. Then annuals versus biennials versus perennials. Annuals, those are going to flower that first year and reseed themselves. So they're going to kind of shift around from year to year of where you're going to see them. Uh, perennials, they often don't flower that first year. They, they won't flower until your second or third year. So you gotta have a little more patience with those. So they gotta grow, get themselves established first. So how about some ideas for your home garden project? I really like that ditch right there. I found that picture online. That's, that's what I aspire to with our ditch along our roadside. How about rain gardens? What is a rain garden? Uh, rain gardens are shallow constructed depressions that have been planted with deep rooted perennial flowers and native vegetation. You are, they are strategically located to capture and soak up rainwater that flows as runoff from impervious surfaces such as roofs, streets, driveways, and parking lots. After a heavy rain, rain gardens will typically fill with a few inches of rainwater. This rainwater can then filter into the ground, helping to recharge groundwater supplies and aquifers. This helps store, slow down and store runoff before it enters into a nearby street or storm drain. So what are the benefits of rain gardens? Uh, they serve as a localized form of flood control. They can reduce the flow intensity of creeks during storm events and help sustain creek flows during dry periods by putting more water into the soil. They can help improve stormwater or help improve water quality by filtering stormwater and can increase water infiltration and recharge groundwater supplies. Not only that, but rain gardens can also be a form of mosquito control. Uh, the reduction in the amount of standing water left behind after a heavy rain um, can facilitate this, but also uh, the length of time that mosquitoes need to complete their breeding cycle is less or I'm sorry, is greater than the amount of time that water stand, you'll have standing water in a well-designed rain garden. Typically, you want to have a rain garden that drains within 48 hours, and that's not enough time for the mosquitoes to complete their breeding cycles. They might 
be able to lay eggs in that water, but those leg, eggs will not have enough time to hatch and then grow into adults. So. Other benefits of rain gardens, they provide habitat for birds, butterflies, beneficial insects, can enhance the beauty of your yard, neighborhood, or business. Say you maybe you have a, just a place in your yard that's just not well drained, not even lawn grass will grow there, it's just kind of you know, a big muddy spot or bare area. Well, that's a perfect place for a rain garden. We you know water's already wanting to go there, so you know, your lawn grass may not do well in that moist condition or you know, not able to handle that moisture as long as it's there, so you know, replace it with some species that can handle those moist periods. So what are some native form species for rain gardens? And again, I have these symbols I created. The full sun, that's fully yellow, like, like I used before, that's gonna be plants that do well in full sun. And then you see uh, below there are plants that do well in full sun or partial sun. So purple coneflower, swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed, black-eyed Susans. I mean, they can, they, back like Susans, I believe, are facultative, but they can handle those periods of, you know, short-term periods of uh, inundation uh, or at least a few inches of water as long as it drains well enough later. Native graminoid species for rain gardens. Graminoids, those are your grasses, sedges, and rushes. So for full sun, common rush, Canadian wild rye, little blue stem, uh, full sun or partial sun, you can put switch grass, tussock sedge, bottle brush grass, scouring rush. So here is a picture of Lake Atalanta, one of their rain gardens. If you go out to Lake Atalanta, the entire park's a great example of rain gardens and riparian buffers and great use of native species for water quality. Uh, this is a picture of a project that Jeff Hickel up at the wastewater treatment plant west side of Fayetteville near Woolsey uh, has been working on for the past few years. This is a really large rain garden out there at their wastewater treatment plant. So you see it has a lot of native species planted. So it's providing a lot of benefits to pollinators and whatnot. Some Ohio horse mint, looks like some Coreopsis in there. What about butterfly gardens? Where's Phyllis? Yeah, Phyllis back there, she will probably be able to answer any questions regarding butterfly gardens. She does a lot in this region. Um, two species that will provide a constant source of nectar to butterflies throughout the growing season. So, you know, that's where you think about the bloom periods. You wanna have something that's blooming in spring, other species that are gonna be bloomed during the summer, other species that will be in bloom later summer, early fall. Uh, variety. Uh, butterflies are attracted to a combination of colors and surfaces. So here's just some general or some different genera of plants that butterflies are attracted to. Um, there are many different species within each of these uh, genuses. So uh, coneflowers, echinacea species, there's pale purple coneflower, purple coneflower, uh, yellow coneflower, uh, there's a lot of different options there. You have a lot of different options with your milkweeds, sunflowers, um, bee balms, the rudbeckias. Uh, not all of these are needed, but if you have a representative, representatives from as many of these different genuses as possible, uh, then you'll have a pretty good butterfly garden. Now some native shrub species for butterfly gardens, Ohio buckeye. Uh, that will have white flowers, uh, nine bark, common button bush. See, I've also included the wetland indicator statuses by each of these. So, button bush is going to like some wet areas, but Ohio buckeye likes a lot more well drained areas. But they all like either full sun or partial sun. How about some forb species for full sun? Uh, rocket lark spur. It doesn't have a wetland indicator status, so you can, you can assume it's an upland species. Spotted bee balm, another upland species. Down there, uh, common sunflower has a lot more versatility. Uh, it can handle a little bit more moist areas. And you have your black-eyed Susans, Lanceleaf Coreopsis. They like some drain, better areas. They're a little more well-drained. Four species for full sun, partial sun for butterfly gardens. Lemon bean balm, 
Dames Rocket, Wild Hyacinth, Cardinal Flower. What about for partial sun or full shade? That's going to be Purple Comb Flower, Blue Stem Goldenrod. It's another great goldenrod uh, for your native plant garden. Mountain Mint, Downy Phlox, Fire Pink, and then the Asters. Those are going to flower a little later in the year, and just that entire genus is great. Um, there's Upland Heath Aster, there's you know New England Aster that likes wetter areas. I mean, there's you get your varieties with the Asters. Now, I added these up here to show just the variety with milkweeds that we have. I mean, we have all kinds of different colors, the common milkweed, the purple milkweed, you know, for purple flowers, maybe you want some orange, you can get some butterfly milkweed, maybe you want a white flower, so some world milkweed. <coughs> Swamp milkweed has a pink to purple flower. <coughs> it's going to like wetter soils as an obligate species. Butterfly milkweed likes drier soils, that's an upland species. Also, butterfly milkweed likes full sun. World milkweed likes full shade. It's found under the forest canopy. So, I mean, depending on the soil moisture condition or the sunlight conditions of your place, I mean, there's usually a milkweed species that will grow there. All right. Some species of butterflies seldom drink nectar, but they do sip fruit juice and sap. So if you leave out fruit slices, especially watermelons, with a few slits on the surface uh, to allow the liquid to pull into those little wells in the slits and place on a saucer about four feet off the ground so it's visible, uh, that's one other way to attract butterflies to your pollinator garden. So maybe you want to provide those if you're going to have host plants for them to lay eggs on. So those fruit slices will get them close to your host plants. Uh, host plants are required by a caterpillar for growth and development, uh, and if you include host plants, then you'll support long-term butterfly populations, uh, and you'll be able to see the entire life cycle of a butterfly. So what about some host trees for caterpillars? Eastern red cedars are great for the juniper hair streak. Uh, hickories support regal moths, maple span worms. Black locusts can support silver spotted skippers. Funeral dusky wings, locust under wings. Willows will support those viceroys, which are often mistaken for monarchs. Black cherry will support tiger swallowtails and red spotted purples. We have a lot of black cherries at our property, and we see a lot of tiger swallowtails on our milkweeds. It took me a while to make that connection, so I started learning about host plants. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, tiger swallowtails also like ash trees. You gotta be careful, green ash can become, it's a native, but it can be invasive in certain situations. Spicebush swallowtails, they like spicebush, of course, and sassafras trees. Zebra swallowtails, uh, pawpaws are their host plant. And the question marks are host plant, or the host plant for question marks are the common hackberries. Milkweeds for monarchs. Passion vine for variegated fritillary and gulf fritillaries. Thistles for painted ladies. Well, a lot of us have heard of bird baths. What about butterfly baths? That's something I actually didn't know about until I started doing the research uh, around a year ago for when I first gave this presentation. So uh, butterflies are attracted to moving water. Uh, you can attach a misting attachment to your bird feeder, uh, have a slow drip, or just put out a water sprinkler. Winterization. Some butterfly species spend the winter as adults. Others will spend the winter as a chrysalis. So a Wood pile or stacked logs can provide safe shelter uh, for those butterflies spending the winter as a chrysalis. I would highly advise you to check your logs first before you put them in your fireplace or wood stove. Uh, just, you know, if there's a chrysalis on there, maybe move it to a safe location. Planting for wildlife. Now, is there anything that deer don't eat? <laughs> yes. I saw this on Facebook, I thought it was pretty cool. If something is not eating your plants in your garden is not part of the ecosystem. 
So things to consider when we're planning for wildlife. We want to provide things that provide food, the forage escape cover, uh, nesting cover, and open areas. So what about for escape cover, nesting cover, and forage? Uh, warm season grasses are going to be great for these. So some of our native warm season, warm season grasses include big blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, little blue stem, eastern gamma grass. Who here has ever seen an Osage orange or a hedge apple? Those big softball size, yellowish green fruits. Yeah, if you, uh, you can, the reason they call them hedge apples is because they were used for a long time by people for planting hedgerows. So what you could do is collect those Osage oranges, those big fruits in the fall or winter, uh, put them in a bucket, five gallon bucket of water, and let it go through a bunch of freeze thaw cycles throughout the uh, winter time. Uh, by spring, it'll, the seeds will be scarified. You can uh, stir that, make a little slurry out of it, dig a shallow trench, and pour that slurry into the trench. Uh, then when they start growing up, uh, you can weave them into your hedgerow. Uh, it will make a great, it can serve as a, as a fence and as a uh, escape cover for many small rodents or birds. Legumes. Legumes attract small insects that quail need for growth. They also improve the uh, soil by fixating nitrogen, taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and exuding it through their roots. Uh, that's something non-legumes cannot do. So what are some examples of our native legumes? Partridge pea, that's this one, uh, or it's the top, I'm sorry, here at the bottom, the yellow flower, butterfly pea up here at the top. Uh, sensitive briar, that's a really fun one because if you touch the leaves, they close up. And then um, tick trefoil. Now this one, you may or may not like, I think it's beautiful, but it also is the one that produces those little green triangular burrs that get all over your socks and shoelaces when you walk through a bunch of them. So. And down here is Carolina vetch. There are some non-native vetch species, but we also have some native vetch species as well. Uh, redbud trees are also a legume. They're in the pea family. So that would be another example of a native uh, understory tree. That's the legume. All right, so when we're planting wildlife food plots, uh, things we want to think about or locations to plant them, edges, transition areas, borders, close to cover, somewhere where they can feel safe, not being too far away from cover. Uh, if you shape them into long strips or give them a lot of curves, that's gonna be preferred to large square plots. Uh, the more surface area on your food plot, uh, the more the animals are gonna be using that. Is there anything white-tailed deer won't eat? Not much, but if you're wanting to plant to attract deer, Maybe just like look at them, or maybe you're a hunter. Uh, oaks, they like acorns uh, during the fall. Uh, red maples, persimmons, uh, native grasses, and legumes. Those are going to be great to attract deer and other wildlife. Native plants for birds. Maybe you're trying to attract birds to your property. Uh, well, these native plants, they're going to bring pollinating insects. Uh, these birds are going to come to either feed on the insects or on the plant itself. So what are some native tree species for birds? Tree and shrubs. We've got American beautyberry, uh, black cherry, eastern redbud. These do well in full sun or partial sun. Notice all these like drier upland type areas or facultative upland species. Um, northern spice bush, pawpaws, red buckeyes, common button bush. These will do well in full sun or partial sun. You can get your range of facultative to facultative wet and obligate species with these. Native grass species for full sun, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, full sun and partial sun. There's those river oats again, also great for wintertime. Native forbs, butterfly milkweed for full sun, black-eyed Susan, landsleaf coreopsis, Rattlesnake master, about full sun or partial sun, eastern columbine, wing stem, and that's uh, one of the plants that's going to make frost flowers during the winter time when it's cold. Uh, frost weed is another word. There's two different kinds of wing stem that we have here or that are more common. <coughs> uh, one produces a yellow flower and the other a white flower. 
uh, and they both produce frost flowers. <coughs> Excuse me. Native vines, there's that trumpet honeysuckle. It's great for hummingbirds. Purple passion flower. Trumpet creeper, another native that hummingbirds like. Yellow jessamine, or jessamine, I'm not sure how you say that. All right, what about just beauty and aesthetics? I mean, what about people that own businesses, storefronts, you know? I think that using natives, you know, they can really contribute to the attractiveness and appeal of a business or storefront, just like as well as non-natives can. Um, here's a, a clump of uh, purple cone flowers that are planted in front of a business I saw in uh, Fayetteville here. Also, residential development areas. This is an apartment complex in Fayetteville, Eco Modern Flats. Uh, they have a lot of natives used on their property there. And this natives can just as easily contribute to the attractiveness of an apartment complex. So. And here is, I believe, one of the ones that Phyllis uh, put a lot of work into with the butterfly gardens that were in downtown Rogers. Uh, and I think they're going to be recreating. They had did some development down there, so I think the plan is to redo those, right? So if anyone's interested in giving Phyllis a hand, I'm sure she would love as much help as anyone is willing to offer. But yeah, native plants can also contribute to the aesthetics of public spaces, especially when it comes to butterfly gardens and rain gardens. I mean, not only do you have pretty flowers, but imagine a park that has pretty flowers and a bunch of butterflies. I mean, I think we're also looking at like educational opportunities for schools. Put a rain garden at a school, you know, and then your biology class can go out and look at the relationship between native plants and insects and birds and ecology. I mean, there's some lessons there. One thing you do need to consider if you're planting for aesthetics is you will still need to uh, maintain these. Uh, they're going to require some maintenance, mainly for the people. Uh, visitors, whatnot, residents that might want things to look a little neater, and you will need to make sure to remove any invasive or undesirable species. So what about some native trees for beautification and aesthetics? Tulip poplar, one that isn't truly native to the Ozarks, its original range uh, didn't go further west than Crowley's Ridge, but has since been uh, planted here and does just as fine here. Um, I think it's okay to use. Smooth sumac, eastern redbud, Ozark witch hazel, and common witch hazel, and river birch. River birch is another one that uh, is great also in the wintertime because it, uh, the way the bark exfoliates uh, produces some really pretty colors and textures in the winter. And birds really like river birch as well. Shrubs, New Jersey tea, fragrant sumac, American beauty berry. Uh, there's a cluster of berries down here at the bottom. Those are American beauty berries. Uh, Northern spice bush. What about some graminoids? Purple molly grass. That's that picture in the upper right. That, uh, that's some really great grass uh, to be used for landscaping. Indian grass, common rush. That's going to like some wetter areas. That one's great for rain gardens. Purple molly, river oats. There's river oats again, broom sedge blue stem. It's another one that sticks around in the winter time, has like an orangish brown color to it. It's really beautiful in the winter. Path rush. I think that one is one that is often overlooked. It really likes compacted soils and can take trampling. It's very wiry. That's why you call it path rush because it grows a lot on trails. Uh, you'll see it hiking the trails here uh, in the Ozarks a lot. I purchased some seeds and I've working to get it established along the trails out at our property <clears throat> that, you know, take you down to the various aspects of our property. I think it's really great. Uh, Wilson Springs Preserve, there's an area where it has really filled in an area of trail and just you can really see how it could be useful uh, for a pathway. What about some fern species for beauty and aesthetic? There's marginal wood fern, sensitive fern, Christmas fern. Royal fern. Forb species, got the purple cone flowers again. Ohio spider warts, bergamot. Ernest, sp er, uh, Ernest spider wart, that's the one I told you that blooms earlier and is much, much shorter than uh, the Ohio spider wart and a lot of our other spider warts. 
And then for some yellows, how about some blue stem goldenrod, lance leaf coreopsis, black eyed Susans. Rattlesnake Meister has a white flower, like foxglove beard tongue, is one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, foxglove beard tongue is, tongue is one of our native penstemons. Common bone set, that's another great one for pollinators. Uh, common bone set species name is Eupatorum perfoliatum, uh, but there are other common species of bone set here in the Ozarks, uh, like Eupatorium serotinum uh, is another one that I see a lot growing in the wild. So where do we get native plants? That's kind of the problem. I think uh, there's a large growing interest in using native plants. Uh, the demand is growing. Uh, the supply is not quite there yet in this region to meet the demand. So there's a lot of people that are having to go outside this region to order native species, um, especially for large scale projects. And the concern with that is we may be bringing in uh, foreign ecotypes that might not uh, be as adapted to the climate and environmental conditions, even though they're the same species, they may be more adapted to different environmental conditions and may not do as well here, or they may be from a place that maybe the last frost is a little later in the year, so they normally bloom a little later, and that can cause ecological problems if it puts them out of sync with maybe a certain species of insect that depends on those flowers being ready uh, whenever they're ready or reaching their life cycle when they need those flowers. Uh, but hopefully that over time that will be something uh, that can change. And um, I think if enough of us start going to garden centers and asking them where their native species are, they'll start to see, okay, there is a demand here. Um, one thing, don't dig up plants from the wild. Uh, this reduces the natural populations and consequently reduces the diversity of that population. Uh, also, invasive species often will fill the space that is left behind. So, I mean, you can collect seeds from the wild. Uh, even then, you want to be careful. Uh, the advantages of this is that it is inexpensive, and the seeds are more likely to be local ecotypes, uh, locally sourced. Disadvantages is, you know, it takes time. Not everything's going to be ready at the same time. You got to kind of collect throughout the year, uh, and not all species produce seed at the same time. So. You want to reseed the annual species if it is desirable to see those species in that location the following year. Because remember, those live for one year, reseed themselves. So whatever, um, if you take all the seeds and you, they won't be there to reseed themselves and grow there. Don't over collect from a particular area. You don't know who's been there before you, who's going to come after you, and what insects and wildlife might uh, need those seeds uh, during the winter time. So a lot of birds may depend on these seeds as a food source in the fall and winter. So make sure you leave some behind for our bird and wildlife friends. Uh, don't collect threatened or rare species. Leave those alone, please. Uh, don't collect from state parks or other public lands uh, without permission where this, uh, this is often prohibited in these areas. What about local vendors and plant nurseries? Uh, advantages of buying from these locations, you're supporting local businesses. Disadvantages is, you know, the, they're not always locally sourced. You got to ask, okay, where are you getting your native plants from? Sometimes they might be locally sourced. Other times they might be ordering from as far away as Pennsylvania. Here are some local vendors and native plant nurseries. The Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist are great majority of their plants are going to be locally sourced. Uh, they have a lot of volunteers that collect a lot of the seeds. Um, and they also uh, each year like to donate a lot of their plants towards projects that maybe a school or a nonprofit or something like that is working on. Ozark native plants out of St. Paul, Arkansas, I believe they have a website uh, and they sell at various locations and they'll announce where they're going to have a native plant sell. Uh, Wild Street native plants. Uh, the same. Pine Ridge Gardens down in London. Marianne is great. Uh, she's also just a great resource on uh, propagating native plants. And then there's Ozark Soul native plants out of Springfield. Um, a lot of times you just need to contact these people, find out where they're going to be selling. And sometimes they'll take an order from you and meet you somewhere in town, you know, in between their plant sales. Um, I've done that before with them for some projects. 
And also check with your local plant nursery. White River Nursery, uh, my understanding, does have native species that they're, they're trying to increase their inventory of natives. Uh, do be careful and make sure you understand the difference between a native and a native var. A native var is a cultivar created from a native species. Some of these are just fine for ecological, uh, or, or they provide the same ecological benefits that their native um, ancestors did, I guess. Um, but sometimes uh, they lose those ecological benefits. It just depends on what they've done uh, to that plant. Uh, Doug Tallamy, uh, who the author of the book, Bringing Nature Home, is doing some research on native ours, and he's finding that some native ours are fine, others native ours are not good. So, Online vendors. You'll probably have a wider selection and availability of species. However, these may not be locally sourced. So if you order wildflower seed mixes, make sure you check the contents. What species are listed on these? Uh, they might have a lot of species. They might say, okay, these are all native species. Maybe they're native where they're selling it from, but they might not all be native to Arkansas. Or sometimes you see pollinator seed mixes has a lot of, will have a lot of non-native species in those mixes. So if you're trying to keep it native, just make sure you look at uh, what the contents are. Also, um, one indication you might get that uh, your sort seeds may not be locally sourced is when the packages arrive and they have Italian on it, like Fragili written on there. So generally those are, you can assume, might not be locally sourced. So what are some great online vendors to order from? Roundstone Native Seed Company, uh, Arkansas Audubon, when they do their native seed collection, they see, send their seeds to Roundstone to be processed. Uh, if you contact Roundstone and say, hey, I want to order some of these species, I'm in Arkansas, do you have any Arkansas ecotypes? Uh, I've been told that they will send you the Arkansas ecotypes. Uh, you don't, I don't think they advertise it on the website, so you have to kind of contact them personally to get those and let them know. And if they have them, they'll send them, that's what I've been told, but they don't have every species and that available. So Missouri Wildflower Nursery, uh, sometimes they will have some local ecotypes and variants of species. Uh, same with Ernst Conservation Seeds. Uh, they'll often offer local ecotypes of certain species. Every once in a while, we'll see an ecotype for either Missouri or Arkansas. Seems like most of their ecotypes will be for further southeast or east coast, but occasionally they will have some ecotypes from our region available. Now, how about establishing native plants? I believe I think that was, Jane, this is another native wildflower garden that Jane helped out with at the Ozark Natural Science Center. I don't think you're in this picture, though. Cold stratification. This is the process of subjecting seeds to both cold and moist conditions. This mimics, uh, after the seeds fall on the ground, this mimics what they go through in the wintertime. Seeds of many trees, shrubs, and perennials require these cold, moist conditions before they will germinate. So in the wild, seed dormancy is usually overcome by the seed spending time in the ground through a winter period and having its hard seed coat softened up by the frost and weathering action. This cold, moist period triggers the seed's embryo. Its growth and subsequent expansion eventually break through the uh, softened seed coat in its search for sun and nutrients. You can store seeds in a cool, not frozen, not freezing environment, moist environment though, for a period of time sufficient for that particular species. Uh, this period of time may vary from one to three months, depending on the species. Uh, you put the seeds along with a moistened stratifying medium uh, in a sealed plastic bag and place it in the refrigerator. The, um, let's see, stratifying medium can be vermiculite, peat, sand, or a combination of some of these, or just a moistened paper towel. Uh, However, if you get started late on this, maybe you're running late and you're not going to have enough time uh, for them to have enough time in the cold for them to germinate by the time you want to plant them. Well, you can soak the seeds in cold water uh, for 6 to 12 hours beforehand to help reduce the amount of time needed for stratification. Uh, just be careful if you have too much moisture in the bag, it can cause mold to grow. Sometimes you'll need to go through and aerate the bags from time to time. But after they have gone through their recommended period of stratification, the seeds are ready to be removed and sown. 
about scarification. Seed coats of many species are impervious to water and gases, which can prevent or delay germination. So scarification is the process of weakening, opening, or otherwise altering the coat of a seed to speed up the process that makes seed coats permeable to, permeable to water and air. In the natural world, often this happens in the stomach of a wild animal. A wild animal might eat a fruit and the seeds pass through it, and that does that weakening of the seed coat, and then when it passes out, it's already there in some fertilizer, right? And then it's able to grow. What are some different techniques we can use to scarify seeds? Uh, if you have a whole bunch of little tiny ones, um, rub with sandpaper. Might try that. Uh, if it's one that you can hang on to with your fingers, clipping it with a nail clippers. I've done that with muscadine seeds before. Uh, crack gently with a hammer. You just got to be careful. You don't want to go too deep into them uh, because, I mean, you can damage uh, the, what's inside and then they won't germinate. Uh, scar scarified seeds do not store well, so you need to plant them quickly after scarification. Now, what about sowing seeds? Now, you can cast the seeds uh, at the same time that the plant or that species would naturally be dropping their seeds or releasing their seeds. Uh, advantage of this, it mimics natural processes. Uh, however, um, they may be eaten by birds or other wildlife before they germinate. Or you could choose to sow your seeds in late fall, early winter, like October, November, December. Uh, disadvantage of this is seeds germinate before going dormant in winter. That can give the plant a head start, and it does better in the spring. Uh, disadvantages, seeds may still be eaten before they germinate. I find if uh, covering it with straw or hay, or sometimes if I'm planting an area that has a lot of leaf litter, pulling back the leaf litter, putting seed down and recovering it, I can help protect those until they're ready. You can hand cast, broadcast, or hydro seed in those late fall or winter months, cover with a thin layer, or like I said a minute ago, leaf litter, straw, or mulch. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on what's already growing there, you might need to sterilize the seed bank. Maybe you have a lot of non-natives or vases in an area. Uh, if you were to, say, go through and till that soil uh, and then lay some black um, visqueen over it, uh, the conditions will cause a lot of the seeds that are in that seed bank to germinate but then they'll quickly die because the conditions aren't there for them to grow. Uh, leave that on there for a full year. Uh, and then the next year you can go through and plant your native seeds and they won't have as much competition. But you're also killing any seed, native seeds that might also be in that seed bank. A seed mix, okay. So if you want to make your own seed mix, I've done this before. You can uh, order it from places, uh, buy the species and kind of mix it up how you want it. I really recommend including annuals and other species that are going to flower your first year just because, you know, it's a little bit of that instant gratification so you don't have to wait three years before you got some pretty flowers. Uh, perennials, like I said, usually don't flower until the second or third year. If you include some legumes like that partridge pea, which is pictured here, uh, that will help add nitrogen to the soil. Uh, you can also just include a nurse crop until the perennials become established. I find the partridge pea makes a really great nurse crop. Transplanting and cloning, better to transplant in late fall or winter when the plants are dormant, uh, less of a shock to the plant. The issue with, with cloning though is that you're not, um, it reduces genetic diversity because you just have a lot of clones of the same species, you know, of a species that are being distributed far and wide. Uh, so that can help weaken that species because they really do need diversity uh, in their genetics to stay strong and resistant to environmental pressures. What about managing and maintaining native plants? Short-term maintenance. Uh, the first year you uh, put plants down, you might need to water them during those dry summer months until they're established. Once they're established, they can usually get through those warm, dry periods, uh, but they may need some help that first year. Don't mow, let them grow. Let them complete their life cycle. That's why we're planting them, right? We want them to produce their flowers. We want them to provide the benefits to the wildlife. Uh, you can still control the invasive and noxious species, but just um, try mowing after the growing season. Uh, usually winter time is a great time to grow. Uh, if you live in an area where you can burn, uh, controlled burns do benefit native species. What about managing our neighbors? Not everyone understands what we're doing here, right? Some people like that nice manicured 
Bermuda grass lawn, right? Start small, expand gradually. It's easier to get neighborhood acceptance when that transition is gradual, as in a lot of things in life, right? Uh, start by planting around a tree. Uh, expand a little bit year by year. Create borders and edges that are well-defined. Uh, these boundaries create the sense that the yard is being managed, uh, not overrun and out of control. Contours and berms help out with that as well. Uh, connecting pathway of grass helps it feel like a yard, not a thicket to your neighbors. Just keep it neat and clean. I mean, make it look intentional. Make it look like that's what you're trying to do and you're not just neglecting your yard. So, from here, what can you do? Well, use more native species in your home and garden. Request native plant species when, if you're hiring a landscaper for your home or business. Start a native plant garden at your local church or civic group or community center. And join a local group or organization that's already involved with native plants. Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalists, uh, a lot of the master gardeners are using natives these days. Um, Arkansas Native Plant Society, I've given a plug already for. And then um, Wild Ones, we're, we're uh, promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Uh, you can visit us on uh, the web. We have a Facebook page. We meet once a month, usually the first Wednesday of the month uh, between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. The meeting location varies. Uh, on March 4th, though, our next meeting will be at the Springdale Library. So we, I got like a uh, year-long program put together. Uh, we'll have different speakers and field trips planned for this year. Uh, we'll be going to visit um, the nursery greenhouse for Compton Gardens on uh, March 13th at 4 p.m. So uh, these are free and open to the public. You're more than welcome to come to any of our meetings or field trips. Questions? Yes? Yes, it's a legume. Unless I'm incorrect, I mean, I, my understanding was that that's what legumes did, but maybe there, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. So I kind of assumed it was because it's a legume, but, you know, like I said, there's those exceptions, so I could be wrong. So maybe I need to go look at that too. So. Anyone else? Yes? I have a section of land that's got weird grasses on it, nothing native, but mm -hmm. I'm on the lake, mm -hmm. and so I want to kill it. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way to do that without getting into herbicides and water? Yeah. the water? Um, depending on the species, you know, some techniques are going to work better than others. Uh, and without knowing what species, I don't know that I could really tell you. Because uh, some stuff, you know, you know, burning doesn't do anything to, you know, like less Bediza. I got a less Bediza issue out of my place. Uh, and I was hoping that I could burn it, but no, I found out that just makes it grow worse. I so, heard of cardboard or even black visqueen. You might try that. Um, I saw a friend use clear visqueen on Bermuda grass, oh. and it just like created a greenhouse, and it, and, you know, it didn't do any good. Uh, so you might try the black. I've heard the black can help out with preventing the, you know, greenhouse conditions, you know, the sunlight getting in. So, I mean, yeah, and, you know, there's a book, great book out there. I, I wish I knew the title, uh, but it's um, just on invasive species and uh, what type of management or, you know, works for different species. Um, and so, like, you know, you know, there's some species of trees, like I've heard Bradford pears, if you cut them down, they send out these suckers, and, you know, it's like a hydra. You cut off one head and two more pop up, you know. And so, you know, Bradford, you know, that doesn't work for that species. So it's... You know, different techniques work for different species. So. Well, the cardboard would disintegrate and help. Yeah, I will see a lot of people oh, use no. that in gardens and whatnot. Even a lot of my, no. my very green oh, friends cardboard. like using cardboard. I'm convinced that the Bermuda grass is the ultimate argument for evolution. Well, it's not Bermuda grass. <laughs> it's it's um, a combination of weeds. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm glad you're referring to those as the weeds. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was at uh, the botanical garden today, yeah. and they were talking about putting down the cardboard and then mulching over the top of it, and it should take six to eight months oh, to fill. Okay, it's so like a full growing season, just about. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that's like, you know, kind of talked about covering a black fish screen, you know, you probably a good year or growing season to work to, you know, right, but you kill don't it off. Do it in the winter, <laughs> you do it during the growing season. Okay. Like, well, like now. Yeah. Was that the uh, vegetable growing yeah. workshop? Okay, I saw that. I wanted to go to it, but, you know, I had this and I was trying to get ready before. I think Megan Lankford did that one. Yes, yes. Cool. Well, a lot of y'all went to it then, I guess. Any other questions? Yes, it will be online for streaming. Oh, great. Awesome. Awesome. And this will, too, later, um, if anyone wanted to go back and look at it. And also have my contact info here. Um, and I have cards also I can give to you if you would like an email address. I'd be happy to send you a copy of the slides. Uh, and also, if you have any questions later, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, so, yes? Uh, I saw several of uh, or a, a couple little plants up there that I have in my, my backyard. Mm -hmm. One is uh, the pur Eastern Purple Wood Sorrel. Is that a violet wood sorrel? Violet. Is mm -hmm. that a, a little big plant? Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, so pretty it's short. Under trees. I'm sorry. Under trees. Yeah, I see. Them, I can see it a lot in partially shaded areas. And then what about the wild geranium? Is that similar to that? Or? Um, I mean, do I don't think they're, them? I don't know how, you know, I don't, they're not in the same yeah. genus and that much. Yeah. Uh, they, they look a lot different, their leaves and flowers. I don't know oh, where okay. on the taxonomic tree they're connected. Okay. I but, think it, yeah, the violet wood sorrel, is, that's a really great one. Uh, the leaves also are edible, have that tart oxalic acid oh, flavor. Okay. Kind of like the yellow wood sorrel that will grow a lot in lawns and whatnot. And they, it looks like little fairy rings sometimes. Do, do they grow like that? The well, wildwood sorrel? These are growing. Okay. Well, right. maybe they put out underground like runners or something. I don't. I don't know. Okay. But, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, you. Yeah. yeah. Is there um, a local landscaper who could give advice? Like, I want more native plants mm -hmm. than I have. But, you know, just right on the foundation, I have these shrubs. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's a native shrub I could replace them. Uh, it, one, yeah. You can give me that kind of advice. Yeah, I mean, aside, I mean, we're, I'm hoping wild ones will eventually, that's what we'll be doing on a volunteer basis. Lisa Morrison, uh, who is uh, the former horticulturalist at, uh, I think she is, uh, was in Megan Lankford's position, maybe. Uh, I believe she, um, uh, does that for a lot of people. There's another group that is at Ozark Ecological Landscaping. Natalie, what is her name? Is, does anybody all know what I'm talking about? I'm sorry? Let me look it up here. There's, that's what she does. Is it Natalie Casey? Yes. Natalie Casey with Ozark Native Landscapes. So she has a Facebook page, and that's what she's doing. Uh, she's doing consulting. She's doing, uh, you know, projects for people and whatnot. Uh, you might give her a call, see what she Natalie, charges. What? Natalie Casey with Ozark Native Landscapes. Yes. I could probably give you a phone number. I have the thing pulled up here, so let me... Okay, it's 479-409-6440 is the number she gives on her Facebook page for her um, landscaping, native landscaping company. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have uh, a stand of bamboo I'm trying to get rid of. Mm -hmm. I know that's a uh, universal. Right, so, yes. But, um, uh, other than taking a pitchfork uh, or, uh, you know, and pulling it all up, pull yeah. it has anybody ever tried just planting, like, in, you know, where they can and then just keep cutting it? Yeah, I, I don't know if that's been tried and that a base of his book, well, I think a friend was asking me about bamboo, and outside of, um, you know, digging it up, uh, it was recommended, the only other option uh, being like a uh, herbicide type treatment so um i think i don't know if there's another way or not i imagine that stuff grows so quickly it might easily out compete anything we else we put there yeah. i don't know if we put maybe a tree there or something I don't, you know that might i don't know i mean that stuff's pretty aggressive and it grows fast that's the issue with it okay there's a 
gentleman here, I can't think of his name right now, I think it's also Eric, but I can't remember his last name, but he uh, is kind of Mr. Bamboo, Northwest Arkansas, some kind of business like that. If you go on, um, on, look on websites and just look for Northwest Arkansas, Bamboo, whatever, and I went over to find his house because I had written to his website two or three times and didn't answer. When we went over there, he was perfectly, wonderfully nice and said his wife was supposed to be answering the email and she wasn't paying attention. <laughs> but she's very nice. Busy. But he knows a whole lot about bamboo. He's got a bunch of it in his yard, but he has put down these very deep metal barriers so that it can't spread. That's out. right, yeah. So when he said about getting rid of it, because we have some in the yard, we have to get rid of it. Um, he said, well, just remember, it's grass. So if you can, we were going to have a backhoe to do to pull out some stumps and things. He said, pull out all the rhizomes you can, cut it, pull out all the rhizomes you can with the backhoe or if you have to dig them. And he said, after that, you're just going to have to go walk it constantly, at, you know, every few days. And whenever it's poking its head up even just a little bit, kick it out, just kick it out. You don't have to dig or anything, just kick it out. He said, after a couple of years of that, you can starve it out. <laughs> and he said, that way you don't have to use, because I was looking at maybe the Forest Service, because they don't have time to do that. What they're doing is they cut it off, and then they have like a foaming sort of a tool with glyphosate roundup, and they put it right as soon as they cut targeted it. targeted application. While it's wet, you have to do so it goes down in it, because then that's going to put, put the glyphosate in your soil. So it's a matter of, um, you know, if you've got the time, if it's your yard, I think that that's an approach that he assures us can work. It's just that, that that's the only way to really do it. Start it out like that. So the whole thing, you know, the thing that you do. No, because it's just going no, to take, cut down and pull out the first time through yeah. the whole thing. So you might have to hire help to do that, depending on how big it is. And then you're just going to have to go out with some rip our toe boots and just kick it. Yeah. And you can spend probably two years on it, and then if you slack that last year, it comes right back. <laughs> yeah. He said it can take two to three years. Okay, yeah. Probably after that, you know, you're going to just keep an eye because you want to try to. It's really hard. Yeah. But, I mean, it's probably more doable than what you guys Yeah. I think we're up to an hour and a half, so. <laughs> Sorry, I went a little late. late. Okay. So if you need master naturalist, you, sh you should get an hour and a half worth of advanced training. I think. And master gardeners. Oh, master gardeners, awesome, great. I per yeah, I need to mention them more. They, they do just a great job. All right, well, thank you all. And we have promotional material on that back table for both Wild Ones and the Native Plant Society. And I have my cards here if anyone wants any.